Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me start with the context. I was in Tajikistan in the winter of 2011 to assess if the design of uh, pilot project climate resilient funds, PPCR funds, were sensitive to the needs of smallholders and especially women. I spent close to a month talking with farmers, both men and women, who gave their accounts on how climate change was affecting their farm practices and livelihoods. While climate change is planetary in nature, its manifestations are actually very localized, particularly in a mountainous geosphere like Tajikistan, where microclimates prevail. And that means that the more appropriate and effective responses also take place at the micro level. I found it is the community that must first deal with the aftermath of climate shocks, and it is often the communities themselves who have innovative solutions at hand, drawing from traditional knowledge and combining with the sciences of adaptation and mitigation to manage both recovery and long-term planning. In this next slide, slide number three, I want to show you very quickly uh, what some of the manifestations of climate change are in Tajikistan. Uh, the most obvious comes from what's happening to their glaciers, which are fed by a combination of snow, melting snow and rainfall. The river system is threatened by climate change in the form of precipitation changes and by retreating glaciers. And I can give you more information on this, but let me just say that in this photograph, for instance, the reservoir on the right used to extend all the way beyond the left side of the picture. And now only a quarter of that water surface remains. What happens now is that farmers plant and graze in that dry area, which puts the remaining reservoir at further risk. This has implications for both men and women. Let's just go to the next slide. It shows you a drip irrigation scheme for a small farm as part of the uh, response to securing water. Let me just add here that the largest and fastest growing group of farmers in Tajikistan is the small family farm, which produces for the commercial market, but at a small scale. These farms make up the bulk of agricultural income and output in Central Asia, and will likely continue to serve as the engine of the rural economy. Yet, their vulnerability to climate change is very high given their size, and farmers' limited technical knowledge, poor access to public and private information, and of course, lack of financial services, all add up. As a group, they start from a disadvantageous position. Why? Because they're already living on marginalized lands, which are environmentally stressed. The more fertile lands, which are naturally irrigated, have already been allocated to monocultural crops and orchards. So these people have to coax their harvests, they have to draw water and fuel, and they're largely ignored by agricultural policy because they're substandard. So here is a pilot project where drip irrigation is put in, and in this case, it was the male member of the household who proudly took me through the gardens. Um, it's interesting that when technology is put in place, it very quickly becomes something that's managed by the men in the household. Unless, of course, it's, it's in a predominantly female household. Uh, next slide. Since we're on the matter of water, I've put here two, two pictures that show you that the collection of water is multi-generational, um, from a very, very young girl on the, on the right side to um, a much older lady. When asked to describe their farm roles, men and women will say, we work side by side on a wide range of farm tasks. We're like a married couple working together. We're like a pair of old boots. In reality, though, there are particular roles that women are expected to fulfill, both on the Deccan farm, which is the sort of cooperative large-scale farm, and on the family plot. In female-headed households, so, women will need to pay for farming services that involve physical strength or mechanization, such as plowing the field. When asked if women were the only ones responsible for fetching water, one woman replied, Yes, after all, it is we women who are using all the water. And as women, 
are in fact using the water for cooking, washing clothes, feeding children, making the dung briquettes for fuel, no matter that it is for the entire household, they are the ones who know how much water they need and so they organize for it to be collected accordingly. In the next slide, we will see men's relationship with water actually has more to do with agricultural work, with watering the livestock, and with storage of water. In the workshops that we organized, the links between their interests in water out in what I will refer to as the public commons and the interests of water management in the domestic arena were drawn out. Men and women were coming from different vantage points, but they knew that ultimately the entire water issue was essentially the same one. They all depend on the same glaciers and the same river systems and that they would need to work effectively to balance out water needs. Over the course of discussions, men would acknowledge then that women did have very specific roles and that they were not involved in some of the roles around water field management issues or the cleaning out of canals so that the water would feed the rice paddies. The discussion would then uh, advance to a talk about the links between maintaining vegetation, vegetative cover, soil health, and moisture content. And this was seen as key to reversing a process that, if allowed to continue, would exacerbate the water loss in the context of climate change. And so you start to draw the links between rebuilding topsoils, long-term wealth, and uh, the vicious cycle of water resources. Um, that's the kind of conversation that brings men and women together. In the next slide, uh, very quickly, I, I will just um, now talk about energy because that is another issue tangential to farming and land use. Although 73% of Tajikistan's population is rural, they actually consume less than 9% of total electricity. Their source of energy is primarily traditional biomass, which in turn contributes to serious and dramatic loss of forest cover. In some instances, I was basically seeing moonscapes. There was just no, not a single twig left on the ground. Rural women share the responsibility for gathering wood and brush for combustible fuel with men, practically all year round. But given that women are responsible for cooking, it's safe to assume that day-to-day -day fuel security lies very much in the hands of women. So what happens? Well, women go and work in the Deccan cotton farms, and they will take um, dried cotton stalks, the, the sort of remaining waste from the harvest, as their payment. Women will work in the mulberry tree farms for silkworms, and they also will take plant waste as payment for fuel for heating the home. These are highly exploitative labor systems that do not conform to international standard labor principles. These brush supplies supplement the use of cow dung briquettes, the making of which lies entirely with women and is very labor intensive. But the women work together. They will work from household to household to household to help each other um, transform these piles of dung into cow patties that they will uh, burn over winter. In the case of extremely poor households, animal dung used for cooking and heating can make up 100% of energy sources. So in workshops over energy, it became clear that men and women together would need to shift their supply of fuel towards alternative, cleaner sources. Pilot projects were being put in place to burn biogas. It still requires brush and water, unfortunately or to change the positions of homes so that they were south-facing and attracting sunlight, or to better insulate homes. And in some instances, these homes were specifically given to uh, female-headed households. And what I noticed uh, is that these households had women who were educated. They were nurses, they were school teachers, they were principals, um, and that, that is an indicator of something. In the next slide, um, as a, 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 one of the ways to address climate change, I want to point out that, in fact, Tajikistan is a center in, in our world for vast biodiverse genes. Uh, it really is a breadbasket for wheat, for grains, for apricots and apples. 
Um, one UNDP initiative <clears throat> is collaborating with the National Biodiversity and Biosafety Center, paying much more attention to wild species which are already adapting to climate shocks. And the farms involved in this capacity building are essentially a living laboratory, testing out the viability and productivity of these wild plants. Men that I spoke to reminisced about lost local foods. Uh, one fellow said, we used to have a type of sweet watermelon here when I was a child, but I have not seen the seeds of this watermelon for years. Women remarked, we have stopped growing the original rice for this region, for which this region is renowned, in fact. We now grow a cheaper rice variety because it grows faster and it sells quicker in the market, but we realize that the older grain is hardier, requires less oil to cook, and it's more difficult to thresh, which is a... Uh, disadvantage, but they were recognizing that these old genetic land race uh, indigenous to the area was something they maybe needed to return to. In the next slide, I wanted to point out um, again as a as a technological response to climate change, <clears throat> uh, glass houses were being built and sheltered cover was being put together. And what I noticed was that under the Soviet system of production, many people have forgotten if potatoes grew on trees or under the soil. And that's a quote from one of the women. And that's because they were no longer farmers at that time, but farm laborers who may have grown vegetables in some fruit trees in their family plots, but really had no farming knowledge. And this poses both a challenge and an opportunity. It's a challenge because people have been driven back to subsistence farming out of necessity with a very thin base of knowledge. It's an opportunity because there is an openness and willingness to learn new methods of climate sensitive ways of farming by both men and women. In a mixed meeting of farmers where the women are quite well established as a group, and I have to say that there is a direct link to their education, the men emphasize that as far as farming work was concerned, they worked equally and side by side. I noted that the relatively high literacy rates of women held them in good stead in their ability to negotiate with men. In fact, the women lamented that they were probably the only mothers in the world more educated than their children. On the flip side, as soon as they were able to leave, the young men would, would, would leave in search of better opportunities and you know, face brutalities of police searches as they moved eastwards, accepting all manner of work in exchange for pay living in unhygienic conditions, contracting TB and hepatitis, and returning home chronically ill. The burden on them and on the women who subsequently care for them is very heavy. Let me end with my last slide here, which is that there are important differences in the gendered roles that rural women and men play. They, they are responsible for these different roles. And appreciating and supporting these roles can be the deciding factor as to whether rural adaptation or mitigation is an efficient use or a waste of resources, and whether community responses are reactive or proactive, spontaneous or planned through, sustainable or unsustainable. Where there is more equal decision-making space between men and women, they are more likely to involve each other, work with each other, and support each other's responsibilities. And, and that's the conclusion I took from my work in Tajikistan. Thank you.